Good evening. We're going to go back to our discussion on argument that we began earlier today. First of all, though, I want to look at 1 Peter chapter 3, and you have um, several very special verses there regarding dealing with truth and standing for truth and presenting truth. Whoever desires life, desires to love life and see good days, let him keep his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. Let him turn away from evil and do good. Let him seek peace and pursue it, for the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are open to their prayer. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. Now who is there to harm you if you are zealous for what is good? But even if you should suffer for righteousness' sake, you will be blessed. Have no fear of them, nor be troubled. But in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy. Always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. Yet do it with gentleness and respect, having a good conscience so that when you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ may be put to shame. Being prepared to make a defense. So that's what we're talking about in the sense of building arguments. Preparing a defense. All right? And so while we discussed that argumentation is not necessarily a fight or a quarrel, and it's not necessarily a pro or con debate. Let's talk about some things that it is. Um, here are three defining features. Arguments require justification of its claim. So you have a claim here that such and such is true. How are you going to support that claim? Right? You want to justify that claim with evidence. Also, an argument is both a process and a product. So you are go through the process of arguing, of developing. And that's what I was talking about, that stepwise action that builds from the foundation of a common denominator up to the place that you're trying to bring your audience, right? And the product is that final um, point, right? That final destination that you're going to. And argumentation both combines truth seeking and persuasion. And we talked quite a bit about that. Now, we're going to come back to this analyzing of arguments um, and ways of listening to arguments and, and um we actually next week we will have some uh, a couple of exercises um, in which you will be analyzing an argument. I'll come back to that, but let's get right into um, this guy by the name of Stephen Toolman. All right, so. We learned that the core of an argument is a claim supported by reasons, right? A claim supported by reasons. And that these reasons can often be stated as because clauses, right? Blank, blank, blank is true because of this, this, this piece of evidence. In the present chapter, we're going to examine the logical structure of arguments in more depth. As you will recall from our discussion on the rhetorical triangle, logos refers to the strength of an argument's support and its internal consistency. The strength of its support and internal consistency. Logos is the argument's logical structure. Well, what do we mean by logical structure? And we're not gonna go off into the 
philosophical field of formal logic, all right? Well, that is important, and there's a place for it. There's not time to develop that in our current course. We discourage students from using the word prove in the claims that they write, okay? As in, this paper will prove that um, euthanasia is wrong. Real-world arguments seldom prove anything. And whenever I say prove, I mean prove beyond a shadow of a doubt. Right? There's always um, room for debate. They can only make a good case for something, a case that is more or less strong. More or less probable. Often the best you can hope for is to strengthen the resolve of those who agree with you or weaken the resistance of those who oppose you. A key difference then between formal logic and what I, we call the Toolman model or real world logic is that real world arguments are not grounded in abstract universal statements. Rather, as we'll see, they must be grounded in beliefs, assumptions, or values granted by the audience. A second important difference is that in real world arguments, these beliefs, assumptions, and values are often unstated, or as we talked about, they're implicit. So long as a writer or audience share the same assumptions, it's fine to leave them unstated. But if these underlying assumptions aren't shared, then the writer has a problem. And so we're gonna illustrate the nature of this a uh, problem through some argument analysis. They, um, the, the uh, source that I'm using here called Writing Arguments by John Ramage, John Dean, and J June Johnson um, uses the example um, of this claim. Women should be allowed to join combat units because the image of women in combat would help eliminate gender stereotypes. On the, say, on the face of it, this is a plausible argument, but the argument is persuasive only if the argue, audience agrees with the writer's assumption that it is a good thing to eliminate, eliminate gender stereotypes. The writer assumes that gender stereotyping, for example, men as the fighters who are protecting women and children back home is harmful and that society would be better off without such fixed gender roles. But what if you believe that some gender roles are biologically based or divinely intended or otherwise culturally essential and that society should strive to maintain these gender roles rather than dismiss them as stereotypes? If such were the case, you might believe as a consequence that our culture should socialize women to be nurturers, not fighters, and that some essential trait of womanhood would be at risk if women served in combat. If these were your beliefs, then the argument wouldn't work for you because you would reject its underlying assumption. To persuade you with this line of reasoning, the writer would have to show not only how women in combat would help eliminate gender stereotypes, but also why these gender stereotypes are harmful and why society would be better off without them. So, Toulmin's model begins, um, they actually define a claim as an enthymeme, or we could even say a hypothesis, right? An enthymeme is the germ of a truth, the germ of a truth. And the enthymeme, um, the enthymeme comes from the Greek in enthumos, meaning in the mind. It's an idea in the mind that lets them be willing to supply the missing premise. If the audience is unwilling to supply the missing premise, then the argument fails. 
Our point is that successful arguments depend both on what the arguer says and on what the audience already has in its mind. To clarify the concept of enthymeme, let's go over the same territory again more slowly, examining what we mean by incomplete logical structure. The sentence women should be allowed to join combat units because the image of women in combat would help eliminate gender stereotypes is an enthymeme, and we already explained how there are certain underlying assumptions that are a given, right? Or certain biases that are already coming with this statement. It combines a claim that women should be allowed to join combat units with a reason because the image of women in combat would eliminate gender stereotypes. So you see the claim with the, arg with the reason. <clears throat> to render this enthymeme logically complete, the audience must willingly supply an unstated assumption that gender stereotypes are harmful and should be eliminated. Or even the assumption that this is um, on its face, um, there is a direct correlation between women in the military and just across the board gender stereotypes. Is there a direct correlation? Though while there is a connection, is there a strong link or is there a strong cause and effect process going on here? And that's an issue even in itself. And we'll, we'll be analyzing that. That's why you have to listen carefully to the process of the argumentation that your opponent presents to the arguments that are being presented by the news, the arguments that you read in the newspaper, um, the arguments in the memes and the Twitter um, uh, posts that you find that you engage in. All these have these hidden assumptions, beliefs, values embedded in them. And it's important to be able to distinguish and differentiate what's going on there. So when we are building our case, claims are supported with reasons. You can usually state a reason as a because clause. We talked about that. A because clause attached to a claim is an incomplete logical structure called an enthymeme. To com and then this is the next part. To create a complete logical structure from an enthymeme, the unstated assumption or assumptions must be articulated. Okay? So the unstated assumptions must be articulated. Now, to serve as an effective starting point for the argument, this unstated assumption should be a belief, value, or principle that the audience grants. Again, we talked about it um, before. We all come with, we all start with certain principles that we believe as, as base level truths, certain biases that are part of our DNA. And we claim those biases um, because we have thought through them, we have um, examined them, analyzed them, and we have supported them for ourselves, right? The unstated assumption that gender stereotypes are harmful and should be eliminated. Now, In your textbook, you will you can see there on uh, on page um,
Let me see. I can't find it at the moment. Um, but in chapter 10, the textbook gives us a diagram of the Toolman model and shows claims, um, a reason, and the, the connection between the claim and the reason is a warrant. Okay? A claim and a reason um, gives you a warrant. Understanding the, our, the language of argumentation, I know these are some um, interesting vocabulary words, but these um, I think are very important. And um, I might also add that they, um, some of these words will be in the final unit test, okay, at the end of the trimester. Enthymeme. Claim, warrant, reason, assumption, and bias. The field of argument requires us to learn uh, only a handful of new terms, particularly the useful set of argument terms, and ones that we will use occasionally throughout the rest of this text, come from the philosopher Stephen Toulmin. In the 1950s, Toulmin rejected the prevailing models of argument based on formal logic in favor of a very audience-based courtroom model. Toulmin's courtroom model differs from formal logic in that it assumes that all assertions and assumptions are contestable by opposing counsel and that all final verdicts about the persuasiveness of the opposing argument will be rendered by a neutral third party, a judge, or a jury. So there's always at least three groups in the dynamic, right? There is the presenter, there is the opposer, and then there is the decider, right? And sometimes in this model, um, the opposer may not be visible. It may be understood. They may be, um, shall we say, in implicit, right? That it may be a principle of opposition that you are arguing against. Keeping in mind the opposing counsel forces us to anticipate counter arguments and to question our assumptions. Keeping in mind the judge and the jury reminds us to answer opposing arguments fully, without animosity, and to present positive reasons for supporting our case, as well as negative reasons for disbelieving the opposing case. But all else, Toulmin's model reminds us not to construct an argument that appeals only to those who already agree with us. In short, it helps arguers tailor arguments to their audience. That's why the skills of listening come in. The system we use for analyzing arguments combines Toulmin's language with Aristotle's concepts of the enthymeme. It builds on the system you've already been practicing. We simply need to add a few key terms from Toulmin. As we said, the enthymeme, um, the third one is the warrant. And the warrant is the unstated assumption that gender stereotypes are harmful and should be eliminated. Right? Sometimes the warrant is unstated, but we have to be able to read and understand the warrant. After we've got the claim, the stated reason, and the warrant, Toulmin then derives his term warrant from the concept of a warranty or guarantee. The warrant is the value, belief, or principle that the audience has to hold if the soundness of the argument is to be guaranteed or warranted. 
We sometimes make similar use of this word in ordinary language when we say that that is an unusually or that is an unwarranted conclusion, meaning one has leapt from information about a situation to a conclusion about that situation without any sort of logical structure. Thus, if we argue that legalizing, okay, for example, if we were to argue that legalizing our drugs or even marijuana is good because doing so will end the black market, we depend on our readers supplying the warrant that eliminating the black market is good, or even that this act actually will eliminate the black market. Like, they, like this act um, is possible that's within the realm of possibility or probability that black market will simply disappear because of the legalization. But arguments need more than claims, reason, and warrants. These are simple one-sentence statements, the framing of an argument, not a developed argument. And so we need to develop arguments with the fourth principle, which is called the grounds. The grounds. What are the grounds? And the grounds is like laying the foundation um, of our argumentation. Here we go. For example, cocaine and heroin should be legalized because legalization would eliminate the black market. Underline the key terms of the argument. Should um be legalized we may or may not agree what is the assumption that black market could or should be eliminated we have these modal verbs that are used um if this should happen then this would happen or at least that's the way the framing of the statement is but um it's not a guarantee Here's a couple more enthymemes. Uh, arguments in real life are built on people's assumptions. They're built on beliefs and values. Leadership, for example, the person is separated from the rest. In a leader, we can use words to indicate this separation, like but. Most people focus on their time off and leisure activities. So this is, this is the way a leader thinks, or he may think of himself, right? Most people focus on their time off and leisure activities, but I spend extra time dedicated to my studies. So, so through this structure, through this conjunction word, but the, the speaker is setting himself into a different category, right? He's setting himself apart. Assumption leads to a warrant, the grounds. The grounds is the supporting evidence for the warrant. How do you know that? Um, the grounds is what gives you the knowledge of something being the way it is in the world, right? There is a sufficient if the crowd already accepts the warrant. So grounds are, you're giving them a, not only a stated reason, but a developed argument based on shared beliefs shared assumptions, okay? But if the crowd is skeptical or cynical, then it is important to um, support your argument with backing. And backing is the kind of evidence that will um, change the minds of your audience change um like minds that are already obstinate or contrary it answers the question of why do you believe that 
Why is this worth believing? For example, grounds say that data and evidence showing how legalizing cocaine and heroin would eliminate the, the black market. In other words, you can use statistics, you can use, um, you can um, use articles, you can use studies, you can use people working behind the scenes, you can use um, police reports. These are the kinds of things that would help strengthen the case. Um, you could also use some pilot studies, right? What is a country that has legalized um, drugs before? We could think of the Netherlands or Amsterdam. What, um, what, are, their, what are their crime rates? What does their black market look like, right? So you can have a case study um, and that would provide grounds for supporting your argument. In many cases, successful arguments require just these three components, a claim, a reason, and grounds. If the audience already accepts the unstated assumption behind the reason, then the warrant can safely remain in the background, unstated and unexamined. But if there's a chance that the audience will question or doubt the warrant, if they doubt the unstated assumption that backs this up, then you need to supply a backing in order to counter a resistant audience. Backing answers the question, how do you know that? Or why do you believe that? Prefix to the warrant. Why do you believe that gender stereotyping is harmful? Why do you believe that the benefits of ending the black market outweigh the cost of legalizing cocaine and heroin? So backing is added to our schema. Tuman's system next asks us to imagine how a resistant audience would try to review our argument. Specifically, the adversarial audience might challenge our reason and our grounds by showing how letting women become combat soldiers wouldn't do much to end gender stereotyping or how legalizing drugs would not end the black market. Or the adversary might attack our warrant and backing by showing how some gender stereotypes are worth keeping or how the negative consequences of legalizing drugs far outweigh the benefit of ending the black market. In the case of the argument supporting women in combat or of legalizing heroin and cocaine, an adversary might offer one or more of the following rebuttals. And so our sixth term is a rebuttal. A rebuttal is evidence that turns the stated or unstated questions, questioning of the adversarial audience. You can rebut the reason, you can rebut the grounds, rebut the unstated warrant or the backing. As these examples show, adversaries can question an argument's reasons and grounds, or its warrant and backing, or sometimes both. The conditions of rebuttal remind writers to look at their arguments from the perspective of a skeptical reader. Tuman's final term, used to limit the force of a claim and indicate the degree of its probable truth, is the qualifier. The qualifier reminds us that real world arguments are never prove a claim, rather that um, they present probable 
strength, probability in supporting a claim. So we say these things are very likely, they're probably, um, or maybe. You know, we use modal verbs in order to support these different claims. So experiment with this. Um, I wanted to show you a Toolman worksheet. So um, there is a writing website for the 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 um, the writing center there at the University of Colorado State. And um, they provide uh, a good work through the Toolman method. That this is just one of many, all right? Toolman's methods are used throughout um, academic writing, academic presentation, academic public speaking, and they are a standard tool of both analysis and logical structure for composition, for writing, for editing. All right, so it's something that is worth um, putting the time in to learn well. And here is um, a Toolman worksheet that may help you to build your arguments, all right? So what is your claim? You know, State it as, as clearly as you can. What are you going to try to prove? All right, so as you are thinking about your final speech, your eight to 10 minute persuasive speech, what are you going to try to prove? And how are you going to try to prove it? Right? What is something that you feel very passionate about that you feel you um other people need to become passionate about you want to change hearts and minds about this um this truth or this purpose or this um social justice or or something like that what is the claim um what are the limitations on this claim how possible or probable is it for this to turn around or be um be a change in the world and then be honest about the exceptions what exceptions exist all right then you provide a reason for your claim right what makes this reason relevant what makes it in other words apply to your audience what makes this reason effective will it do what it says it's going to do how do you know what proof do you have, right? What evidence supports this reason? Is this reason evidence sufficient? Is this evidence credible? In other words, is it believable by others? And then is this evidence accurate? And you work through these questions for each part of your speech. Um, it's good to have an outline. It's good to go back to the former um, lecture that I gave about um, about brainstorming and outlining and begin to put together what you what is needed for this persuasive speech. It may be built on top of, your informational speech. It may be something that um, you gave information about, but now you want to take it to the next level. When you are trying to persuade, it's just like the exercise that you just did on the sales pitch. You have to tell the audience what you want them to do about it. Not only do they make a decision, do they change their minds and make a decision, but that decision should lead to action. What is the action that they should be pursuing? Ask for the sale. 
right? Ask them to commit. Ask them to do something. Um, also, you can build into your structure also objections. What are some common objections to this thing that you've seen um, people mention? How do you answer that? What's another objection that you've seen people mention? How do you answer that objection? And so on. So use this uh, worksheet to help you get started on working through your persuasive outline. And I hope to um, post another part of the argumentation soon. Take care.